So let's talk about zero knowledge proofs. Yeah, how they um, connect to the K framework and uh, matching logic and uh, runtime verification <laughs> overall. Right. So let's let's start with um, the basic question. Okay, what is a zero knowledge proof? Mm -hmm. So. Why don't you? <laughs> Actually, I didn't think of uh, starting this way. So I wanted to start from the fact that uh, how we look at computation. Mm -hmm. So in my view, there are two aspects of computation. Mm -hmm. One is how to get them quickly, right? And uh, this has to do with algorithms. You know, we have this very fast key backend to do computation quickly. Mm -hmm. um, the other aspect, which is also very important, is how to make sure that the computation is correct. And based on our experience. Uh, you have a proof of mm -hmm. it. Right? So every computation that happens in K is going to be um, justified by a proof object. And we encode this proof, pass it to a proof checker, and that's how we do it. But then there is a question, right? So we have this proof generation work in our CAF 2021 paper. We have some preliminary you know, prototype implementation. And one thing we learned is that the proof objects are huge. Right. right? So, so what happens is you can take a very simple language, let's say imp, right? It's mm -hmm. the simplest imperative language you have. Mm -hmm. And let's run a very simple toy program, say factorial. Like want to calculate the result of factorial of 100. Yeah. And some computation, I get a result. I can generate for that computation a correctness proof. Okay. Right. That result is indeed correct mm -hmm. with respect to the formal semantics. Mm -hmm. But that proof is probably, you know, of million lines of code, you know, yeah. if they can have um, hundreds of megabytes of steps. of steps. So that's a big problem because, um, you know, the proof objects to this witness uh, is too huge to pass around. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so the question is, can we find a way to hide them? Okay. So let's, let's go back to the basics. Okay? Yeah. So once you have a formal semantic of a programming language in a framework, like K. A programming language becomes a mathematical theory, like we discussed in machine logic, one of those gammas, right? Gamma solidity, let's say, right? Programming language solidity has a formal semantic, becomes a theory in the logic. Mm -hmm. All right, now suppose that you have a program in this programming language and you want to execute the program. That's why we write programs, we want to execute them. Okay, so we execute the program. So in the context of a logic framework like K, which has a logic foundation, program execution is a particular kind of a proof mm -hmm. of reachability. Yeah. Right? I can start with this state where I have the program factorial and, and the initial, initial state and so on. Initial, initial state, matters. everything, yeah. the state of the memory, stacks, everything. Mm -hmm. I also pass the input 100, let's say, to that program. Mm -hmm. And then it does its thing, it computes, mm -hmm. and it produces a result, factorial, 100 factorial, whatever it is. Okay? So this is actually a mathematical theorem mm -hmm. that factorial of 100 reduces to the huge number, Yeah. Okay. which is a theorem of, or a valid, a valid statement, reachability statement of the programming language, or do you have a semantics? Mm -hmm. yeah. And one thing that we have done, that you have done mm -hmm. in particular, is to instrument the K framework so that when you execute a program, you can extract from this execution a proof, mathematical proof, of the corresponding theorem right. or reachability claim. Mm -hmm. And this proof basically goes down to the axioms of matching uh, of the programming language, yeah. solidity, the theory, and every single step is derived using the fixed generic proof system of matching mm -hmm. logic. Yes, yes. All right. So that's so, the way the algorithm you use to get the computation down is not relevant anymore. Right. So once you have the computation, once I have this proof, yeah. Um, I, I know the computation is correct. It doesn't matter how you get it. Right, right. This is actually one way to abstract away implementations of programming languages. Yeah. Right? I don't care how you implemented your programming language. 
provided that you can give me a mathematical proof that factorial of 100 is this number. It's the same principle as saying uh, translation validation. It's for translation validation lifted to compilers and program execution. Mm -hmm. Right, okay, so the nice consequence of this is that we reduce the problem of computation to something we understand as a species <laughs> a bit better, which is that of a mathematical proof. Yeah, right. Because we we dealt with mathematical proofs for five thousand years. Well computation only for like fifty or so. <laughs> All right, good. So now we can use all the arsenal of tools that we know for logic and reasoning in order to reason about computations and explain computations. Right. Yep. Okay. So now one problem we have with blockchain in particular is that if I want to convince you that factorial of 100 is this big number, right? I have to give you the program, the claim, and then you re-execute the program mm -hmm. on your side. Right? All these validators on the blockchain, they re-execute the program. And many people complain. They say it is a big problem actually with the blockchain, all these redundancies. Even if we don't do proof of work and do proof of um, stake, it's still a problem. Conceptually, we don't like duplication. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's engineers, it's mathematicians. It is, it is it's the same competition. The same competition done over, done over and over again, right? So it would be nice to send you the proof. Once I do the proof, mathematical proof, on my computer, once I run the program on my computer, I get this proof from the execution, mathematical proof from the execution. I should be able to give you the proof. Yeah. And then you just check the proof. The problem is that this proof, as you said, is huge, is much larger than the program execution itself. Oh, <laughs> much larger. Much larger. It's still linear, probably in the size of the program execution, not in the size of the program, the program execution. So if you take the loop a hundred times, it will be a hundred times. Yeah. Right? yeah. Uh, that size. Um, so, yes, it would be nice. It is nice to reduce the problem of computation to, or checking computation to the problem of checking the proof, but the proof is huge. Yeah. Okay, so one question is how to, or one challenge for us is how to compress these proofs, how to make them really small, and ideally how to make them constant size, <laughs> if possible, even. Yeah. Okay. And, and this is where zero knowledge. Yeah, this is why zero knowledge, the technique of a zero knowledge proof is very, very interesting. Here. Because uh, if you think about it, what I hear is really the proof object itself. Mm -hmm. What I hear is that there exists such a proof object of my theorem. Mm -hmm. So, so, right, so, so what is a proof checker? If you want to claim a theorem, yeah. right, you don't need to give me a proof. You only need to give me a guarantee that you have a proof. Yes, yes. That's enough for me to trust the theorem. Yeah. In particular, to trust that factor of 100 is that number. Right, right. Okay. So, so what is a proof checker in the end? It is everything that takes two inputs. One is the theorem or the proof obligation, you know, from this accent, the form semantics, I, I can prove this computation is correct. The other okay. is the actual proof object, you know, this huge. Right. Right. The first is the claim, thing. the second one is the actual proof. The actual proof. Yeah. And somehow the statement I like to convince to our customers uh, is that there exists a proof, which is given to the, as a second input to the proof checker, such that the checker says yes. So this is where this uh, zero knowledge proof plays a role here, because I can use the technique to hide the second part. Well, uh, in zero knowledge proof, there are many reasons why you want to hide inputs. You know, sometimes you know because of uh, privacy. But in our case, probably you know, it's but not really not a problem. Problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I would be glad if you look at the proof. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The proof is huge. It's not a secret. Right. But it's huge. It's just too huge and uh, it's very inconvenient to pass it around. Okay, so let's get back to the original question. What is zero knowledge <laughs> proofs? What is the zero knowledge technology at a very high level? And then let's go into how to use it uh, for our need. So basically, it is a technique where you have uh, you have a computation mm -hmm. down. Um, and uh, you have two entities, right? The prover and the verifier. And the prover is going to be able to convince the verifier that, you know. But this is a different kind of prover, not like our prover image. Yeah, not like our prover. It's a cryptographic. <laughs> it's a cryptographic proof. Yeah. So in our setting, right, the proof, the cryptographic proof is going to be that there exists a matching logic proof object, right. which will pass, right, the proof checking algorithm. So, 
Oh uh, yeah, I would say that's basically the idea. And there are many, you know, possible ways to you know, how to actually combine these two together. So one will be to utilize all these existing zero log uh, zero knowledge frameworks, which provide you a sort of like a, a very generic programming language. So let's just finish the discussion on uh, zero knowledge. What is zero knowledge proofs? Okay, so we have a prover, a zero knowledge prover. So basically, something that takes the data that you want to, you know, to say that yes, you know it, mm -hmm. right? And does something with it, and then produces a certificate. Mm -hmm. okay, and that certificate then is passed to others, who now have to trust that indeed I had that data and I checked it. Okay, and it is as I claimed, okay? And that certificate is very small in size, sometimes constant. Const of the constant there. Yeah. So a checker, now we have the zero knowledge prover and the zero knowledge checker. Yeah, ZK prover and ZK okay, checker. Okay, that's what I'm going to get, right? So the ZK checker now can check that, let's say ideally, instantaneously, mm -hmm. okay? So it's fixed size, let's say 256 bits, I send it to the checker, the checker checks it inside and says, yes, that theorem holds. In particular, that program execution, factor of 100, is that number. Right. right. So that's, of course, it's idealistic. <laughs> there are lots of details underneath, you yeah, know yeah. that. But now let's simplify the problem, you know, for the sake of understanding it, mm. okay, and explaining it. So, all right, good. So this technology is there. Uh, it's been invented since uh, 85 or mm -hmm. so, 80s. Um, uh, Silvio Micali was one of the co-authors of the zero knowledge proof ideas, right? the creator of the Algorand blockchain Algorand, uh, the founder Algorand blockchain Algorand mm -hmm. uh, algorithm, which were so formally verified, actually. <laughs> it was quite, uh, quite fun. Um, right, so it's, um, right, so getting back to zero knowledge, uh, Technology. So, right. So now we'd like to combine it, right, with, um, with, um, our notion of proof checking <laughs> or proof derivation checking. Yeah. Right. Uh, in legend logic. Because if we have that, then we can take literally any matching logic claim, any theorem, be it the result of a computation mm -hmm. or some property of some program, mm -hmm. like this program is an ERC20 program, right. or anything for that matter that can be stated, anything K does is search for a proof <laughs> of some theorem in machine logic in the end. Right? So that will allow us to basically essentially have ZK proof certificates for anything, any, any computation. Of any programming languages, computation or verification, or verification, or, or any claim right. of any kind that is logical. And Given that the formal semantics are defining okay, which by the way, you right. know, many that we need the formal semantics. So that, that's yeah. something that's something that uh, I keep hearing people complain about. You know, when, when they get to K or any language semantic framework, they say, "Oh, yeah, but now I have to define a semantic for my programming language." You have to do that anyway. If you want to claim anything, even that that program does that, or even that program executes on input one and gives you output two, you need to somehow say what the programming language is. What many, people, what many people do, they say, well, this implementation of it is a programming language, like GCC. GCC is, the, is C. Okay? No, but then, then we have Clang, okay, another implementation, or ICC. And guess what? Actually, it does different things. <laughs> it shouldn't, but it do different things. Yeah, right? So you need some way to encode, to provide your programming language anyway. Yeah, that's a starting point of uh, talking about formal correctness. Otherwise, even execution, yeah. even anything, mm -hmm. right? And if you have to do it anyway, then let's do it only once <laughs> and for all, right. right? Not, you know, once in a compiler, once in an interpreter, once in a formal verification tool, once in a model checker, once in a symbolic execution engine, and so on and so forth. Just drives me crazy when, mm -hmm. when people, you know, complain about having to define the form of semantics. I think it's the same philosophy of applying to ZK proof. That's, uh, you know, yeah. we like it and let's see if we can do it in a language agnostic, independent way. Right. So that's the idea here. There's a challenge. Yeah. Here, right. Actually, by, when we isolated the problem, right? So obviously, what we wanted initially in the spirit of the K framework, let's do zero knowledge proofs. 
and verifiable computing for any programming language which is ever formal semantics. Mm -hmm. Okay, that was the initial uh, goal. And then this, it happens many times in science when you start thinking about seriously about the problem, you discover new things and you get with more general solutions. <laughs> okay, actually now we reduce that problem to a much more general problem. Given any proof, any mathematical proof, step by step okay, of a theorem, right? I want to ZK the actual whole proof knowledge <laughs> that that proof exists. And now I can claim theorems. Okay, so this is more general than verifiable computing for programming language. Yeah. Because computation that is a particular proof. Yeah, that's a <laughs> special important use case of it. Yeah, yeah. And many, many others. Right. So right, so tell me a bit about your um, recent work on this topic, right? So you started uh, implementing <laughs> right, so you first you implemented this uh, this MetaMath, right, proof checker for Matching logic. Yes. yes. And so, you're connecting so, it to K. So by the way, so MetaMath is a very small form of language in which you can state abstract actions, you can state abstract proofs, and uh, it has a proof checking mecha mechanism. Yeah. So and the matching logic, the, the syntax and the proof system of matching logic are implemented in MetaMath. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're talking about actually the MetaMath checker here, which right. by the way is, is very small. It's just a few hundred lines of uh, code in uh, uh, in Haskell, in Python, there are many, many yeah. independent implementations of it. So I think the MetaMath is so simple as a language itself. Yeah. That it has like dozens of implementations of a few hundred lines of code in lots of different programming languages. Right. Okay. Yeah. And now you have the proof checker of matching logic implemented in 200 lines of MetaMath. Yeah. So it becomes like a MetaMath program. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. So, and what what we're trying to do is to try to utilize all these existing zero knowledge framework, like Kailo or like a risk zero, which provides you some, you know, which allows you to write pro programs in a certain limit, say Rust, mm -hmm. uh, and will automatically compile that to a circuit. And from which, you know, a zero knowledge framework. So basically, I'm implement a checker for MetaMath, same like the others. Yes. I see, using now one of these ZK framework frameworks. That yes. Is it. yes. Okay. So, like our uh, one of our ongoing efforts is to implement the checker in Rust, mm -hmm. and then to pass it to the zk, uh, to the risk zero mm -hmm. zk framework, and to generate a proof for it, mm -hmm. the zk proof for it. Of course, there are a lot of engineering challenges, like the yeah, yeah. You know, the framework only supports a fragment of the language, so we need to do a lot of refactoring and so on. But um, yeah, that's our ongoing progress, and um, we actually, uh, you know, very recently got to a milestone where we can actually generate a ZK proof for a MetaMath file. What does it mean? <laughs> Is that I can have a ZK proof saying that there resists a MetaMath definition, which, which will pass the checker. Of course, that's not very interesting. <laughs> so yeah, what I really want to prove I want is, more. <laughs> yeah, I want more. So we, we, we want to output the theorem, the actual theorem and the axioms, right? From which the theorem can be proved. Right, that's great. Yeah. First so, step, first step, so it can be done. Yeah. yeah. So still the proof of concept level, but but there are positive signs. Yeah, that's our uh, that's part of our big vision right? to be yeah. able to have uh, zk proofs for all languages. I mean, this this would be huge. If this works, it would be amazing, right? I mean, um, maybe you know some of our I don't know <laughs> followers of this video. I'm not very familiar with all the mathematics underlying it. But let me tell you one thing that you can do with this. Um, you know, we have to dream once in a while, right? So we have to go into the future. Say, once we have this, once we do this, what can we do with it? Right? So I think that, um, I mean, there are many applications, immensely many applications of, of, uh, of uh, connecting ZK with, some, with a semantic framework. I cannot even enumerate them because I don't know all of them, but be many of them. Right? But let me tell you one, which I think can be pretty transformative, right? So we can now create a blockchain in which you can write smart contracts in any programming language. One. <laughs> Two. You only need to execute those programs once, locally, and then 
commit the result and all the validators check instantaneously and validate and, and, uh, and uh, commit the, 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 the results of the blockchain. Okay. Three, <coughs> all these programming languages themselves become part of the blockchain. They are like smart contracts on the blockchain. Okay, and that address I have Solidity version 1.0.2. Mm -hmm. Okay, but that address I have Solidity version 1.0.3. Right, on that address I have Rust version X, version Y. I have that language, the other language. So all languages become part of the knowledge <laughs> that is permanently stored in the blockchain. And logically, they, they are theories. They are not multiple theories, they are semantics. Actually, everything on this blockchain, I didn't say that yet, but everything on this blockchain will be either a theory, a mathematical theory, or a claim. Okay, and they will be connected. The claim will be connected to the programming language through local validation mm -hmm. and then generation of a zero knowledge uh, uh, proof certificate and then committed on the blockchain by all the other um, uh, validators which only need to check. The, the zero knowledge uh, certificate. So, I mean, this this would be like almost like the dream of the blockchain community, right? We have a blockchain. We can write smart contracts in any programming language. Only once, execute them only once, and the programming language themselves will be part of the blockchain. They will be vetted by committees, by standards committees. Okay, so the creators of Solidity version one point zero point three will vet for the um, vet definition. Say yes, this is the definition of the language. It's basically the formal mean. version of a, of a standard of a language. There will be a rigorous, yeah, exactly. So if you go to jellopaper.org, mm -hmm. right, that our, or IO, I forgot, <laughs> that our, uh, our company, not a verification, right, uh, posted on the web. Um, many, many people consider that to be the standard um, uh, definition of EVM now, because the yellow paper is a bit obsolete. No, this replaces the yellow paper. The same should be with any other language. Actually, so users of that, read people, developers, look at that definition and they think it's okay, it's readable, it's human readable, it's not uh, like super rigorous, super, it's not unacceptable, mm -hmm. un un unaccessible. <laughs> it is not unaccessible to non PhDs, non formal methods, mm -hmm. people. You just look at it and it makes sense. Okay, if I don't not to mention that, that that definition is executable. It's executable, it can be used with actually it's, it's symbolically executable, it can use it all proofs, everything that K that K does. Um, so imagine that definition ought to be part of the blockchain. You put it on a smart contract somewhere, it becomes knowledge, right? Public, publicly available knowledge and vetted by somebody and trusted by the rest of the community. Mm -hmm. By everybody who wants to write programs in that language. You'll have to trust the language. See, this is the language which I'm writing this program. Yeah. And this program executes and has this result. And now it can be checked with that particular programming language that this result is indeed correct. I don't care how you execute that program. You execute locally, doesn't matter. You have your own interpreter, your own compiler, locally on your machine to be fast, fine. But you'll have to produce a certificate that you were able to generate a proof, mathematical proof of correctness of that execution, and that was checked yeah. um, by the ZK. Uh, proof checker. Yeah, to, to make this big picture work, uh, you know, these proofs, the correctness pr proofs are so important. And that, that's why really this ZK technique is a very crucial part of it. Because uh, I cannot imagine it would pass around you know, millions and lines of you know, very huge proof projects around that certificate. You really have to something that's really small. Yes. Yeah. Not to mention that there are so many things that can go, um, you know, wrong um, uh, in the sense of malicious users. Um, mm. the blockchain or of such a technology, right, could um, infiltrate, you know, like new axioms in the theory, they can try to cheat yeah. the proof, you know, do something fishy and so on. But say, say if I ship you like a huge proof object, they may, you know, set some new it. steps and right. try to, to break it. Mm. But if you do everything, you know, with a trusted proof checker locally that cryptographically signs your, um, your uh, proof checking, <clears throat> um, then that's it. Yeah. So yeah, I'm optimistic that this will be done. I think there are no deep theoretical challenges here. It's more of an engineering. Well, challenge. Mostly right engineering because uh, you know 
we know that proof objects are huge, right? So that can be a real challenge. You know, can we really have an efficient way to generate a ZK proof certificate? Yeah, that's uh, that we'll, we'll see. We don't know yet. Right. So most likely, most likely what will happen. So, in, so these proof objects are so huge that even storing them on your local machine <laughs> can be a big problem. Yeah. Okay. So then the challenge here, the engineering challenge here would be to check the proof object with the proof checker if you generate them actually from the program execution or whatever you do with the K framework. And also ZK proof check mm -hmm. <laughs> at the same time. Right. So it's so on the fly. Time. So the proof object is never stored. Entirely no. generated once. It's, it's generated always... and consumed on the fly. Yeah. If you generate it. Right. That would be an interesting uh, challenge. Mm. So we'll see, we'll see how it goes. Um if all this engineering you know, effort kind of, you know, ends up not scaling, then we may need to look into more foundational questions, right? Can we come up with a new ZK technology, a new way to check, um, you know, to generate and check mm -hmm. the knowledge proofs? Mm -hmm. uh, maybe something very specialized to mathematical proofs, like in the methodology proofs. Because right now we are trying to general technologies, general ZK technologies, you know, yeah. like this Cairo programming language or like uh, uh, risk, of zero. risk zero. If they work, great. But if they don't, then we need to dissect them, mm -hmm. go to the heart of the problem and implement that from scratch or adapt it first and then implement it first from scratch for, for our checker. Yes, for our good checker. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think that that, uh, that is possible and it's super exciting. This will enable a future that uh, will make so many things so much easier and nicer. Yeah. And it will save a lot of energy, right? And no duplication. Everybody hates duplication. There will be no duplication of program executions anymore in any languages. Mm -hmm. And actually, <laughs> can you even eliminate the need for implementations of programming languages. Why, why would you need to implement a, a programming language and have it on your machine um, uh, to validate my computation? Mm -hmm. I run my computation once on my machine, and then I can wait a bit longer to run the proof using the K-generated tools and the ZK checker and so on. So instead of five milliseconds, I'll spend 10 milliseconds mm -hmm. to run the program. But then you don't have to run it. Nobody else has to run this program ever again. Yeah. 